Hi, I'm Art Bergeron, and welcome to Bergeron Briefs. Uh, this is my attempt to do a series of 15-minute deep dives into specific topics which are kind of the answers to the questions that I inevitably get regarding various things. This one is all about whether you need a revocable trust as opposed to an irrevocable trust. So I often get this question. You know, what, you know people will come into my office, my friends Frank and Mary, who you've all met and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And, and, and they'll say, well, I, you know, I, I, I need a trust. And I'll say, well, why? Well, look, because all my friends have a trust. They told me I have to have a trust. Well, there were really kind of two kinds of trusts, um, revocable and irrevocable. I'm gonna to talk to you today about revocable trust because if you are Frank and Mary and, and you are um, still a couple, right? Or if you're single, it may be that this is a device that you really want to use, especially if you're not really old. So Frank and Mary have very simple goals in their life. They want to live in their house until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. They want to leave all their assets eventually to their kids. And inevitably, they're telling me they want to avoid probate. Now, why is that? You know, people will say, oh, I really want to avoid probate, but they're often not quite sure why. Well, let me tell you a little bit about probate and then that'll give you a sense of why it is that you may want to avoid it. So first of all, probate isn't like this really terrible thing, right? And the point, of, and probate has a real point. The point of probate is to make sure that any assets that you die owning in your individual name will go to the right people, right? Now, inevitably, people will say, well, I have to have a will because if otherwise it's all going to go to the state. Well, no, uh, but the point is people worry about making sure the assets go to the right people. So the point of probate is to figure out who gets what and everybody wants to do that. But the other point of probate is to get creditors paid because if assets that you own in your own name at the time of your, that you die go through probate, before they can be distributed to anybody, creditors have to get paid first. And creditors in Massachusetts have one year from the day of your death to file a claim against those probate assets. Now that term, uh, that length of time is much longer than it is in many other states. In many states, that period is like 60 to 90 days. So you may talk to people, like if you go to Florida, if you're traveling, they'll say, God, probate doesn't take that long. Well, <clears throat> it's all a function of this length of the creditor period. It's long in Massachusetts. Now, once the creditor period has expired, the person who is, is in control of the probate process, who is the, called the personal representative, or the, it used to be called the executor or the executrix, will then divide up the assets. The way that that person will divide them up is first of all to see if there's a will. If there's a will, then the personal representative is simply gonna follow the terms of the will. By the way, and I get this regularly, wills do, having a will does not mean you're avoiding probate. Having a will simply means that at the end of the probate process, the assets are gonna be divided up according to the terms of your will. If you don't have a will, then the assets get, get divided up according to the rules of intestacy. Now, those rules, if you're Frank and Mary and you've got three kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., may very well be the exact same rules that you would wanna follow through your will. So it may be, uh, and people are always amazed when I say this, that you don't need a will if you're okay with those rules and you're not bothered by going through probate. The, the, the rules of intestacy in Massachusetts are very simple. If you die leaving a spouse, the spouse gets everything. Uh, if you have no spouse, then assets get divided among the children. By the way, that's the rule unless this is a blended marriage, unless it's, it's husband and wife and one, one spouse has kids by a marriage, the other spouse has kids by a marriage. In that case, those rules may differ. You want to talk to an attorney about that. The point, and, and by the way, um, if you have no children, then the assets go to your parents. If you have no parents, which typically you don't if you're older, right, then the assets get divided between, among your siblings. If one of your siblings has died, that share goes to the nieces and nephews. There's this whole system. And so, once again, you may want to talk to a lawyer, see what would actually happen if you died with your assets, and then see if in order, you want to modify that, and if you do, then you want a will. The point is, though, <clears throat> that before that happens, you have to go through the probate process. The process is that somebody, typically the person you've named as the personal representative in your will, uh, will file this will with the probate court together with a petition, a long document, that indicates, among other things, who the heirs would have been if there had been no will, 
because those people need to be notified because they're the most likely people to want to contest the will, right? Um, so that you, you'll file that form, you'll, a, a, after some amount of time, typically depending on the county, uh, if you're in many counties, this process takes about two months before the, your, per, the, your, your, the personal representative will get approved as the, as the representative of the, of, the, of the estate and the will will be accepted as the final will. In a few counties, um, which I won't name, the, the, the process is gonna take longer just because of administrative backups. But the point is, at some point, um, someone's going to get appointed. Uh, and by the way, the, how long it takes to get them appointed is totally unrelated to this one year creditor period. Whether the person gets appointed a month after you die or five months or six or seven months after you die, creditors still only have one year from the day of death to file a claim against the probate estate. Once that year is up, then the personal representative has the ability to make the distributions to the various um, beneficiaries that you've named, presumably, in your will. Why avoid probate? Well, first and foremost, because of that delay. Uh, oftentimes, what you, what you would hope to achieve if you die is that, is that things are as simple as possible and as easy as possible for your kids, so things will get divided up right away. Also, there are the legal costs. The cost of going through the process that I just described, if you're having a lawyer do it, dealing with the initial filing and getting you approved and dealing with creditor issues and doing the final distribution and doing an accounting to everybody, that's gonna cost you about $5,000, unless there's a contest. And that leads to the, 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 the other issue. This, this is a very public process. All of these documents are filed with the Registry of Probate and open to the public. Um, to the extent that there's some dysfunction in your family, this is when it's gonna show up. Somebody who is dissatisfied with whatever is going on is going to be able to contest things. And if they contest them, not they're not necessarily going to win, but they can gum up the, the process and force legal extra legal costs and hearings and things. So that's the reason why people um, should be thinking that they may want to avoid probate. What are the alternatives? Well, the, the, the obvious two alternatives for avoiding probate are that you have your assets owned jointly with someone. If you a have assets owned jointly with someone legally, each of you owns 100% of the assets. So in the case of Frank and Mary, if they own their assets jointly, uh, like their house or their bank accounts or whatever, legally when one of them dies, that person's interest simply evaporates. The other person becomes the sole owner. That's an easy way of doing it. The other is to have a revocable trust. Um, the revocable trust. What is, first of all, revocable? Revocable means that whatever you've put into the trust, you can always take back out of the trust, um, as opposed to an irrevocable trust. We'll talk about irrevocable trust in a later seminar when we're talking about asset protection for mass health and, and nursing home uh, purposes. So revocable means whatever you put into it, you can always take back out of it. Typically, these trusts are also amendable so that while Frank and Mary are alive, they can change the rules at any time. And if typically, if one of them has died, the other one can continue to be able to change the rules at any time. In this case, Frank and Mary would be the trustees of the trust. They'd be co-trustees, and it would specify in the trust that if one of them died, the other one would become the sole trustee. So it is exactly the same as what they probably have right now, which Frank and Mary own the assets jointly. They own all their assets jointly. So instead, they hold these assets as the joint trustees of this trust. If one of them dies, the other one's in control. The only thing that changes is, is when the two of them have died, when the second person dies, instead of that person's asset then needing to go through the probate process, a successor trustee is named, typically right in the trust, it's typically one of the kids. At that point, that child can step in immediately, divide up all the assets. The advantages? No probate, immediate distribution, and also no creditors. That's important if you have some creditor problems, if you've got credit card debt, student loan debt, things like that. Um, the, the, the pro, if, if assets are going through probate, the creditors that you have are gonna be, if they don't, assets go through probate, the creditors you have will have a claim against the probate estate. No probate, no claim, which means your creditors get wiped out. Uh, which is sometimes handy. So in the case of Frank and Mary, let's just look. Frank and Mary own their house jointly. They have savings accounts jointly. Frank has an IRA, uh, but he's named Mary as the death beneficiary. There's the stuff in the house, but that nobody ever goes to probate regarding the stuff in the house because the, no one cares after, the, after you've died 
who owned the desk or the chair or the dishes, you know, someone's going to do a yard sale and someone's going to buy those things and pay money in, in return for the dishes. They don't care that you can prove title to the dishes. The point is, those, say those are the assets that Frank dies. Frank dies, there is no probate. Why? Many of the assets were owned jointly with Mary. So Frank's interest evaporated, Mary became the sole owner. Regarding the IRA, there was actually a death beneficiary named in the IRA. So that asset doesn't go through probate unless Frank forgot to name a death beneficiary. The car. The, the car used to be the most common cause of an inadvertent probate. These days, or I shouldn't say these days, a number of years ago though, the legislature resolved this by, by passing a law, that, by creating a law that said that if one, if one spouse dies uh, married, the other spouse is presumptively the joint owner of the car. So that the, the surviving spouse can simply go to the registry with a death certificate. Um, the, the registry could ask you for a marriage certificate, but typically they don't. They just want you to fill in a form saying that you're married to so-and-so. Uh, and then they will change the title of the car into your name. The only issue with probate, therefore, would come if Mary died. If, if Frank died, all assets became Mary's, Mary then dies. In that case, there would be a need for probate. And in, in, but in, in that case, if everything were in a, tr in a revocable trust, the, all of the assets, the, the, could be, would, the new trustee would have total control of those assets and could move those assets at any time. So that is, it's, it's important to Mary, in the case of Frank and Mary. It's a very important to Peg. I always talk about Peg, Mary's sister Peg, who is single uh, now, and she has a daughter, Peggy, and she has a house worth 600000 She has bank accounts, they're just in her name. She has an IRA, and it names Peggy as the death beneficiary, and she has a car. So what would happen if she died? Everything would need to go through probate, unless the assets were jo owned jointly. We talked about joint ownership. The question in Peg's case is going to be, though, is she comfortable having assets owned jointly, not like with a spouse, but with her daughter? Because if they're owned jointly, then they're owned jointly. And Peggy technically is 100% owner of these assets also, which means if she's got creditors, they can go after those assets. If she gets divorced, those assets are going to be part of, Mary's, of Peggy's assets for purposes of figuring out the division. And she's got the ability to cash things out. She's got control. So if Peg wants things ultimately to go to Peggy, but doesn't want to lose that control, that's when she would create that revocable and amendable trust. She'd be in control. She'd be the trustee. She'd probably name Peggy as the successor trustee um, after she dies. This trust, grantor, these are all so-called grantor taxable trusts. So for tax purposes, Mary, or Peg still owns the house. If Peg sells the house, she still gets her capital gains exclusion. When she dies, the tax basis of the property jumps to the date of death value. So Peggy won't end up paying a capital gains tax. Um, this won't cover the car. To deal with the car, Peg would really need to tell Peggy, give Peggy a power of attorney and then tell Peggy, look, if it looks like I'm going to die, go take my title and your power of attorney to the registry and transfer the car to your own name. And that way it won't have to go through probate. So I know we covered a lot of stuff today. I just wanted to give you this sense of what a revocable trust is. By the way, you can pronounce it revocable or revocable. You actually look in the dictionary and you can do it either way. This trust can be very beneficial for single people, no matter what age, um, or for single people because you were married and then somebody died. So in, in the case of Frank and Mary, you may not need it. If you're PEG, you probably do if you want to avoid probate for the benefit of your kids. Thanks very much for watching. If you have any questions, um, please give me a call. My, uh, my direct line is 508-860-1470. Uh, and we'll see you on the next Bergeron Briefs if you want to watch some more Bergeron Briefs. Thank you.